Now here at VGS, we like to look at all the different components that make a great game, whether it's the writing, art design, or the music in this case that creates the experience. Now who better to talk gaming and music than the award-winning Jason Graves, composer behind the terrifying Dead Space, and now the memorable Tomb Raider. Thank you, Jason, for taking the time. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for letting me be here. Absolutely. Now, um, individually, how did you get involved firstly in musical composition and then find your home in gaming? You know, I didn't start out in gaming, but even when I started out composing, uh, there wasn't as big of a call for music and games the way there is now. I started in film and TV back in the mid-90s and kind of did the whole school thing and was really into film music and did a little bit of that for a while, but creatively, it wasn't really scratching my itch. So I actually left Los Angeles and came back home. I live in North Carolina in the U.S and um, just kind of stumbled across someone about five years after I moved back home who needed orchestral music for a video game. This was back in 2002 or 2003, I believe. It was the King Arthur video game that was based on the movie of the same name. And I literally went from doing corporate videos and lots of advertising and things where I would spend six weeks on 30 seconds of music, just changing it, changing it, changing it, according to the producers. That first video game, I did 45 minutes of music in three weeks, and they didn't have a single correction. Real, and that's and obviously very different for you then. As a creative person and someone who really enjoys their work the most when they are able to be creative, that was just the obvious goal, ultimately, was to do more work with video games. And from then on out, that's what I tried to do. Now, since that time, how have you seen the role of uh, music, a musical composition, and its involvement in games change? Because like you said, that was back in the late 90s. Now, how is it? How is the industry in terms of uh, representing musicians? I think now is better than ever. It seems like that's kind of what a lot of people in technology mm -hmm. say. But it really came from, you know, you can start the music and you can stop the music back in the day. And maybe you can have a little stinger that plays at the end when you stop the music. So it doesn't just stop kind of mid midstream. Nowadays, especially with Tomb Raider is the perfect example, it's a really sophisticated, detailed, almost subconscious method that the music is reacting to the gameplay. And you could have five, six, seven, eight different things going on, kind of constantly moving in the background, depending on what you're doing as the player in the game. And it works on this subliminal level where you almost don't even realize how much it's changing because it's constantly changing. And that's, uh, that's what I love about the creative aspect is getting it to play back interactively and really underscore the experience in real time while the player's playing. Well, creatively, like you said, when you're trying to make an experience now that calls for almost the subliminal soundtrack, what are some of the, I imagine there must be some great difficulties in ensuring that you find that sort of place within the game, where like you said, it's something that's a constant, um, there's always music in play, there's always some sort of melodies and tones in play. Creatively, do you find that more of a difficulty to ensure that it, it does stay in that subliminal le level when it's needed to be, or is it more freeing because now you have the opportunity to play and, you know, uh, make what uh, perhaps you always wanted to do? That's an excellent question, and I think what most people don't realize about music in general, this can be for TV, film, or game, the composer is not actually the one who has the final say in what the music sounds like. It's, it's a producer or a director, maybe an audio director if you're in games. So creatively I'm free to do whatever I want but it always comes back to the person in charge of the music ultimately at the developer who can kind of scratch their head and go yeah I don't think that's really working and I've had a lot of creative kind of back and forth well you don't need to have music playing all of the time you don't need to have a two minute loop that plays for 20 minutes while you're going through the game and sometimes I win sometimes I don't with Tomb Raider from the beginning, they just said, what do you think would be the best for the music? And I said, don't have a lot of it, especially at the beginning of the game. It needs to be thin and sparse, and we need to have some place to go and build, because this is a reboot. Laura is starting back at the beginning of her career. She just got out of college. She's 21. 
She's inexperienced and green. And if we started the music, I mean, imagine some college student walking up a mountain and there's this huge epic score playing in the background and it doesn't really fit with their personality. So we started small and I think it takes a great deal of confidence and respect in the composer for a developer to do a reboot like this of a game of this magnitude and start really small and quiet. And that's the kind of thing, again, creatively, it was very satisfying for me. They never challenged me. They always embraced anything that I had to uh, suggest. Well, very well said there. Uh, for someone who really has no conception of what this sort of process is like, can you take us through it a little bit of uh, your role in creating you know, music for games? And really, I think the uh, most important question is where does it start? Do you have an understanding of the overarching story? Is it more specific of individual scenes need your attention or uh, do I have it completely wrong? No, that's that's a great overview. And obviously it depends from game to game. And I think a lot of it has to do simply with time. If you're talking about a big title like Tomb Raider, I was involved for almost three years. And that doesn't mean I was composing for three years straight, but there was kind of on again, off again moments. So they would come to me when they had gameplay that was finished, that I could either sit down with them and play, or they could send me a game capture in a quick time movie. And once we play through the game, we would talk about it the way we would a film or a TV show. You know, when she gets out of the cave, do we have music there? No, we shouldn't because we had a bunch of music in the cave. Let's have it be quiet for a minute. Or maybe we should have some music that's really quiet and then builds up to the next moment. It's a lot of kind of abstract talking. And once we figure out what the music needs to do, I go back and write it and we figure out how we want to put it into the game. You know, depending on whether it's combat or it's exploration, maybe it's a cinematic that just plays straightforward. But the luxury of time lets you try different things, and maybe they don't work, and you can go back and do something else. Uh, other times, for example, I did some DLC work, downloadable content for Devil May Cry. They had about a week to do maybe an hour's worth of music which is not a lot of time. And it was literally, they sent me all the gameplay they could, and I got to see the gameplay before I composed, but there was no time to experiment. We just had to kind of move on our gut, and that's why they hired me, because they didn't have a lot of time. And it was just boom, 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 boom. One little tweak, everything was finished in a week. And I'm just as happy with that music, but I'm happier when there's time to experiment. Those, are, those would be two good extreme cases. Okay. Yeah, well, it does seem, um, what you're talking about here, that iteration really is the key, like most things, especially in gaming, to getting that product to the perfection that you as a composer are looking for and obviously uh, the game designers uh, striving for as well. You know, it seems like an obvious statement saying, hey, the music <laughs> sounds better when the composer got to see the game he was writing for before he wrote the music. Are there but, circumstances where that doesn't happen? Well... Earlier in my career, and this was earlier in games career, in general, just the gaming industry, a lot of times um, there was nothing online for me to see. I could see some artwork, and everything was coming online at the same time, including the music. So I would literally have an Excel sheet, Combat 1, Combat 2, Combat 3. We're in World War II, and we're fighting in the sky with airplanes and go. And I just kind of do what I thought was best and then eventually I'd hear it. You know, when the game came out, maybe they'd send me a copy and I could I could see the way it worked. But that was back then. And nowadays people seem to have a lot more thought to put into the, the timing of the schedule for the music. Hey, we don't need to wait until two minutes before the game's getting finished to start on music. Let's get the composer involved earlier. And that always ends up for a go figure, more well thought out, well planned score. Well, yeah, it, within our series, we're trying to cover all the different components that uh, traditionally, when we're looking at games, kind of got what you just said there, the treatment of we'll deal with that uh, much later. We'll give the attention to something that now seems so vital, like in most cases, um, making sure you have high-quality writing, high-quality musical composition. It was almost secondary, and I think that is uh, really the most surprising thing from talking to you, how the pacing of um, the choices you're making musically in the game is so comparable 
to every other design strategy, whether it's the writing principles, the art design, it still seems to be such a needed and considered approach. And I think for a lot of gamers, it's not something that you're necessarily as aware of, that you are taking this considered approach, and perhaps that's a testament to its success. What do you think? I agree, and I'm one of those composers that always cringed when, and these are big-name film composers, would say, well, the best film score doesn't call any attention to itself. I, the best film score to me is Star Wars or something. Superman, they call a lot of attention to themselves. But in games, I think the best implemented game scores, the, the way it's getting hooked into the program and the coding that's reacting to what the player is going around, going around doing in the game, the better implemented it is, the more you don't notice it in the sense that if it were not implemented well, you'd think, man, the music's kind of annoying. Or, boy, I've heard that song five times before. It keeps playing again and again. If it's done well, the music's moving with you, and then you get you progress through around the corner. The music's changing, and it, it acts subliminally. It, it's not calling attention to itself in the fact that it's being repetitive or tapping you on the shoulder going, hey, are you scared now? Are you scared now? You're exploring, and you're scared, right? Right? You know, it's... It's subconscious. It's, it's kind of oozing into your pores, and you don't even realize. Well, a great example of that is uh, your work on Dead Space, where there's so many instances where it is just stark, not a single noise is made, and then instantly, yeah, it's always the uh, perhaps the cliche in gaming that once you reach a certain point and you hear a certain melody, you realize as it slowly progresses, something terrifying is about to happen. And um, reminiscent of uh, Dead Space, I would say there are many instances where it was even more surprising. We didn't we didn't even fall into that cliche of oh no, wait, it's a, we hear some violins now, something must happen. They did a really good job. They did a lot, and I mean a lot of research with horror movies. And I think that games have so much more to offer than a film, but we're not there yet. And starting with research in film, which is a much older art form than interactive games, is the perfect place for developers. You know, they're picking up ideas for mood and tension, especially with horror, how to build tension. And uh, the audio directors, especially for the Dead Space series, realized that it wasn't about the boo. It wasn't about the jump out and scare you. It was the build up to it. It was the tension that led to the boo, where if you're coming up to a corner and the music's building and building and building, you could literally have a white fluffy bunny rabbit jump out. And if the music stung it correctly and preempted it the proper way, you'd still jump out of your chair because it just prepped you for whatever was going to happen. It was going to be really scary. And that's uh, that's absolutely applicable to Dead Space because oftentimes you're seeing the same sort of enemies coming at you again. You're seeing similar sorts of enemies, but like you said there, every corner, every new a door that's opened, there was always the possibility, and I think this is uh, directly attributed to the music, that it could be something you've never seen before. And a wonderful thing I loved about Dead Space, I, I called it the, the random bucket of fear, but... Essentially, I wrote uh, more than a hundred different stingers, just little short, you know, three to five second musical gestures, which were usually horrifically awful sounding. But what we would do is categorize them and classify them, and there might be 10, 15, or 20 in one of these categories. And if you went around a corner and something jumped out and killed you, it would trigger one of these stingers. Well, if you go around the corner the second time because you just died and you have to replay the event, it would trigger a different stinger. So you never kind of got the same experience, and I'm doing air quotes there, the same experience twice. Even though the game plays the same, the music would play differently. And the idea was it just kept you on your toes all the time. You really never knew what was going to happen. And that really is what you just said there, a revolutionary way to consider uh, music and gaming. And I think it's something that most, if not 90 to 100% of gamers when they're playing, wouldn't really consider and know that, wait a second, the music's different now because they're so enthralled with the experience. So absolutely fascinating that there is uh, that sort of logical process behind to make sure that it is different. In the same way that um, developers of writing and art design want to make sure that when you reload certain instances, that it, it isn't all the same. So I think it's uh, really amazing that that same attention to detail is being brought to something that uh, even you said traditionally wasn't really the case. And I love learning 
new ways of doing things like that. And what I love the most about my job, I'm an independent contractor, so I might do, you know, between eight and 12 games a year, and usually five or six are kind of going on concurrently. Not all at exactly the same time, but kind of like you're in college, you got five or six classes. Sometimes your tests line up, sometimes, you know, you can kind of make sure that you have tests on different days, and that's how it usually works for me. But the greatest thing is, I'm working with people who have blinders on almost, and they've worked on, you know, they've been in games as long as I have, but they've worked on three titles, because it takes them three and a half or four years for each one of these titles. So I'm able to kind of come in with this bag of tricks, and, you know, gathering everything I learned from new titles. And especially now, since Dead Space, a lot of times when I get hired, one of the first things they say is, Okay, talk to us about implementation. This is what we have. Uh, I know we can do lots of other really cool things. We just don't know how to do it yet. What have you been doing on the last couple of games? And I'm able to share you know, that experience, and then we end up learning more stuff together and figuring out new tricks, fast forward to the next game. It just kind of keeps building and growing. Well, you touched on it right there. Too often when I'm trying to describe a game to someone else who perhaps hasn't played it or played it a long time ago, undoubtedly, the first thing for me that comes to mind is those punctuated uh, sounds, those moments, those memorable moments, and the soundtrack that follows. Creatively, we talked about it a little bit earlier, where do you bridge the gap between the music stop from being that sublimitable force and to being the central focus? I know creatively there must be individual cases, but uh, for you developing in games, do you find that there's a real difficulty to find that place, or is it a natural sort of uh, translation? Boy, that's a really good question, and I think the easiest way to me answer, for me to answer that quickly is to talk about the main theme from Tomb Raider. We did a new theme for Laura, and we wanted it to be iconic and memorable. We wanted to brand the game with the theme, but we didn't want to overstate it. We didn't want people rolling their eyes when it played. We didn't want people kind of shrugging it off because they've already heard it 50,000 other times, and it's important to have the overall sense of the game kind of from beginning to end, which a lot of times when I'm brought in, it's only halfway finished, so you have to be flexible. But having some sort of idea of how much music there's going to be and where the major beat points are, you know, they always start with, okay, these are going to be the five really cool scenes we're going to have in the game, and then they start filling in stuff around them. So it's easier for me to think about it that way. We want to have our theme here, but it's going to be quiet. And then later in the game, when she's gaining more confidence, we'll put her theme here in this combat situation, like on the last level of this big boss, we'll bring the theme in, and it sounds like it's empowering her, and maybe the, the players will feel like they're, you know, they're stronger now as opposed to being broken down by the music. So much of it is psychological, and whenever I did anything, especially with the theme, I would always send it on a separate track so we could use it, but if we determine later on when we're playing through the game, yeah, that's a little too much. And we would just mute the track. And it was it was really easy to kind of pick and choose where to bring something in and really call attention to the music and when to just kind of let it pass by. Well, it kind of seems uh, from talking to you and getting now a greater understanding of musical composition in games that it's something you really notice when it's done poorly and it's something you really notice when it's done to that level of perfection. Would you agree with that assessment? I think that's that's a pretty good assessment, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, as someone who's had great success in operating within this industry, final word, again, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. We really do appreciate it. How do you see the relationship between music and gaming changing in the next few years as you've seen it changed in the last 10 years? Boy, that's a deep question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, would, I, I think that... It's, the, you know, the easy answer is just more of the same, but I do think that it's going to get more interactive and it's going to be easier for the developer to create this interactive music. It, it keeps getting easier. The software keeps getting easier to use. It's quicker to implement the music. It used to take three guys a week programming away in code to get anything decent, even starting and stopping. Now you can have one guy who can spend maybe a day each week and he can put in the music that I wrote for that week. I think that is the, the arc that we're looking at. It's going to be faster, quicker, easier. Hopefully more and more composers will have experience writing for those kinds of systems because that's the best feedback you can get. No matter what you're trying to learn, just doing it 
and hearing or seeing your end result and learning from it. And I think it's just going to keep getting more advanced, separating itself from film and TV music and just kind of being this really subtle, sophisticated, interactive music system. Well, thank you again, Jason, for uh, taking the time. We do appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure, Andy. Thank you. Now we have Jason Graves, the musical mind behind games like Dead Space, and of course the new Tomb Raider. The music that you heard throughout this interview is all the music that he worked on for the game. So if you did enjoy it, uh, where can they reach you? Because I know you do have a website that has all your stuff on it if they uh, did like this and wanted to see more. Absolutely. SoundCloud, Facebook, Twitter, the whole shebang. There you go. Well, thank you again. This is Andy Burkowski, Game Substrate.